Thanks very much, Ralph. It's nice to have a podium here with a bit of a boost. I usually feel like I'm a short guy, and this helps me out a lot. We've heard an awful lot over the course of this conference about the amazing things that have happened and the truly astounding things that are going to happen as a result of advances in technology, including advances in artificial intelligence and robotics. I'm going to talk to you today about a potential development that should never happen, that we don't want to see occur as a result of advances, particularly in artificial intelligence and robotics. And that is the development of fully autonomous weapons, or better known, perhaps more accurately known, as killer robots. These would be future weapons that would no longer have meaningful human control. These would be weapons that, on their own, select targets and decide when to pull the trigger. Humans would no longer be in control over these key combat functions of target selection and kill decisions. This is something that many people find frightening and unacceptable. We have launched a global campaign to stop killer robots that is aimed at a preemptive prohibition on fully autonomous weapons, a new international treaty that would ban the, the development, production, and use of killer robots, fully autonomous weapons. I said these are future weapons, but they are under development in many countries. And if we are not successful in our campaign to get a new international prohibition on these weapons, they will become a reality. It's very clear that the trend in modern militaries is toward ever greater autonomy in weapon systems. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. There might be some both military and even humanitarian benefits to greater autonomy. But there's a line that should not be crossed, and that's the line where you take the human out of the loop and you have the weapon system itself deciding what to target and, what, and when to fire. There are, these systems, as I said, are under development in any number of countries. The ones that you might think of uh, are at the forefront, the US, Russia, China, Israel, South Korea, the United Kingdom. Germany even has a, a fairly robust R&D effort aimed at greater autonomy. There are already precursors, what we call precursors to these systems that are in existence. The platforms are already there. Don't think so much of the Terminator, think more of drones. This goes beyond drones, uh, because with drones you have a human operator that's in control of targeting and firing. But the future killer robots might look like drones, might look like aircraft, might look like smaller armored vehicles might look like stationary robots of sorts. So they're not going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or the Terminator. Uh, and they're unlikely to ever reach the point of sentience that uh, we see in the movies. But they're similar in that humans no longer have control over the most basic and important combat functions. The campaign to stop killer robots has cited a wide range of reasons to oppose these weapons. We're convinced that they cross a fundamental moral line by ceding life and death decision making to machines. We think it's highly unlikely that they would be able to comply with international law, either international humanitarian law that is in play when you have an armed conflict, or human rights law that comes into play for domestic situations. Because you can be sure that if these weapons ever become a reality, they will not only be used during armed conflict, they will also be used in domestic law enforcement situations, whether it be 
riot control or border control or normal law enforcement, policing type operations. They will become ubiquitous, which is another reason to strongly oppose them. You can be certain that if these weapons come about, they will proliferate rapidly. They will get into the hands of virtually all governments, including those who are the most irresponsible and those who are the most uh, likely to commit abuses with such systems. So they're potentially immoral, potentially illegal, and certain to get into the wrong hands. There are also potentially technical issues uh, to deal with as well, but I'll perhaps pass over uh, that particular aspect. I'll talk a little bit more now perhaps about these various reasons for objecting to the weapons, and then I'll get into what's being done uh, about them, and perhaps what you all can do about them as well. I'm convinced that we will be successful in this campaign to preemptively prohibit killer robots based on the experience that I've had in banning three other weapons during the past 20 years. Preemptively banning blinding laser weapons. Banning anti-personnel landmines, the campaign that Jody uh, led on. And then the subsequent campaign to ban cluster munitions, cluster bombs. Based on how all of those campaigns unfolded, I'm convinced we can also preemptively ban killer robots. And I think the main reason we'll be successful really is because of the moral and ethical considerations. These have been called the ultimate affront to human dignity because you take away this uh, decision-making over who lives and who dies. Humans no longer make that decision. Machines make that decision. Machines that are compassionateless. Machines that are unable to reason. Machines that are unable to be deliberative about what they kill or don't kill. They would operate on a series of instructions that have been programmed. A list of instructions is not the same thing as moral reasoning. I found in talking to audiences, there's what um, I oftentimes like to call the UG factor. When you start talking about no longer having humans in control over life and death decision making, people tend to screw up their faces and maybe get a little knot in their stomachs. They know instinctively that this is wrong, that it's just not right to do that. And you're crossing uh, a boundary which should not be crossed. There's actually something in international law that reflects this. I prefer the UG factor, but there is something called the Martin's Clause in international law that says that if a weapon is against the principles of humanity, if it goes against the dictates of the public conscience, that nobody should ever acquire it. Well, we're convinced that uh, killer robots would not be able to comply with the principles of humanity and would not be consistent with the dictates of public conscience. So uh, I, I think in the end, that will be the determining factor because citizens will instruct their governments not to move forward with these kinds of weapons simply because they don't pass the moral and ethical litmus test. But there are many other concerns as well. Uh, and, and for Human Rights Watch, foremost among those are legal concerns. Inability, unlikelihood of them being able to comply with international humanitarian law, the laws of war that govern armed conflict, or human rights law, including the key principles of distinction and proportionality. It's just unlikely. One never knows what might happen in 50 years or 100 years, but it's, it's unlikely that you would have these systems that would be able to distinguish adequately between civilians and combatants. It's difficult enough today for humans to do this, uh, particularly given the uh, number of times that you have combatants who are not dressed like combatants, not located in, in, in areas that are, uh, that are limited to combatants. The idea that you could have a fully autonomous weapon, for example, that would be able to tell whether or not a soldier is surrendering. 
or whether it is hors de combat, whether it's a soldier who's been injured or uh, who's been injured gravely, uh, is no longer a legitimate military target. So these are very difficult things to do unless you have human perception. Law requires that a commander for each and every attack determine whether or not it is proportional, whether or not the military benefit uh, exceeds the potential danger to civilians. Uh, this is something that is largely subjective and intuitive that requires human reasoning. Uh, and so it's unlikely, again, that you'd have compliance um, with this key provision of the law or the requirement to have military, to determine the military necessity of any, uh, of any attack. Then there are the proliferation concerns. As I mentioned, it's, it's, it's highly likely that um, if these ever come into being, they will spread all around the world very quickly. Uh, we have a group of artificial intelligence experts who have said that as we have advances, these are likely to become uh, more and more cheap and more and more easy to produce. They call them potentially the Kalashnikovs of the future. So it wouldn't just be a couple of high-tech countries who have these, it would be everyone. Um, and another kind of proliferation would be perhaps the proliferation of wars and armed conflict. As you take the dangers away from the soldiers, the likelihood of them being employed rise a great deal. Uh, I see my time's going by quickly here, so maybe I'll turn to what's being done about it. Uh, as I said, we launched this campaign to stop killer robots now a little bit less than three years ago. It's a group now of about 60 non-governmental organizations in about 30 countries that call for this preemptive prohibition. Since we've launched the campaign, tremendous progress has been made. Um, we have seen two dozen Nobel Peace Laureates echo the call, uh, thanks to the efforts of Jody, whose Nobel Women's Initiative is one of the founders of the campaign, and the whole thing is pretty much her idea. Um, and we have had uh, about 80 different faith leaders uh, from across the world and across all faiths uh, support the call for a ban. The UN Secretary General, the International Committee of the Red Cross, we have a European Parliament resolution calling for a ban already. And very importantly, this past summer, uh, a group of artificial intelligence experts, uh, roboticists, and other related scientists all issued an open letter that called for a preemptive prohibition on these weapons. So the community that is most affected and potentially would benefit the most financially from this has called for the preemptive prohibition. Those of you who have not signed this open letter and uh, who is relevant to you, I urge you to do so. It's, it's being coordinated by the Future of Life Institute. It's a major boost for the campaign to have this community backing it and quite unusual for the community to back it as as scientists tend not to want to get involved in such issues. Governments have taken up the issue much more quickly than they did our other issues like blinding lasers or landmines or cluster munitions. Uh, talks are underway in something called the Convention on Conventional Weapons, a very cleverly named forum that's based in Geneva that is the main focus for disarmament work in the world today. And that's now the main issue on their agenda. They've had several weeks of discussions on it over the course of the past year. And there will be a, a, another session on these in April of this year, followed by a determination at the end of the year at what's called a five-year review conference of this Convention on Conventional Weapons uh, about whether to continue the work and what to do about it. We're calling on them to begin formal negotiations on a new treaty that would preemptively prohibit the development, production, and use of these weapons. It's going to be hard to do. There are certainly, uh, we're, we're in a situation where there are many governments who have now expressed their concern about these weapons, who said there must always be meaningful human control over key combat functions. But there are still many governments who are pressing forward with research and development activities related to these weapons. So we're in a crucial point in time over the next 12 months, 18 months, of whether or not we're going to be able to have success in this preemptive prohibition. I think there's a big role to be played by the people in this room, by the 
roboticists, by the artificial intelligence community, by the tech community more broadly to push, to push their governments and to push the diplomats to take this up in an urgent fashion. Uh, this open letter from the uh, uh, AI experts very importantly said that fully autonomous weapons are years away, not decades away. They believe that, that the technology is going to progress so quickly now that it may be just years, not decades, before these things come into existence. So if we don't act quickly now, it's not going to happen. What's very important is that the scientific community doesn't stand back and essentially simply say, we like the pure science aspect of it. This is not a political issue. It's an issue for humanity, and we all have a responsibility to try to help deal with it. Thank you.